So in this video, we are going to start discussing the skeletal system and your 206 bones that you have in your body. In this video, we're going to look at how bone is made through this process called ossification. And we're also going to look at a very general structure of a bone and like the channels it has and things that it run through it. So in the case of your skeletal system, your skeletal system, as you guys know, its purpose is to protect your organs. It gives you structure, muscles attached to it. That's how you actually physically move. It makes your blood for you. It stores minerals for you. And so when we talk about the skeletal system, we're going to be looking at your, your bones, your actual 206 bones of your skeleton and the different types of cartilage, elastic cartilage, fibrocartilage, hyaline cartilage. We'll also look at your joints and how joints are classified. And we'll be talking about ligaments and tendons. Ligaments and tendons are both types of dense, regular connective tissue, if you think back to the tissue unit that we talked about. And ligaments' job is to connect bone to bone. This is how like your arm bones stay together, or your hand bones stay together. And tendons' job is to connect bone to muscle. And so we'll talk more about tendons when we do the muscle unit. Well, like I said, your skeleton does to have 206 bones, and we take it and we divide it into two main categories. Your axial skeleton is what you would think of as the bones that actually make up your body. So the cranium, as you know, is your skull, and we'll talk about all the bones of the skull. Your vertebra and the five sections of your vertebra, which, as you know, are your, what you call your spine. Costa, which are your ribs. You have 24 of those. Your sternum, which is your breastbone, and your hyoid, which is a very unique bone that is in your neck region. Then when we look at the appendicular skeleton, we're looking at your appendages, your limbs and your girdle, basically what you call your arms and legs. And in the case of your appendicular skeleton, we have what we call your pectoral girdle. So everybody knows where their pectoral muscles are, it's in your chest. Your pectoral girdle are basically the bones that make up your shoulders, your arms, your wrist, your hands, and what you call your fingers. You then have the exact opposite, which is your pelvic girdle, which are your hips, your legs, your ankles, your feet, and what you call your toes. And we'll be looking over all of these in this unit. Now, if I were to ask you to name why we have the skeletal system, you could probably talk about a lot of these. There might have been some here that you're just not familiar with. So we know that what gives our body its shape is the fact that we have bones that hold us up. So it does support our body. We've also talked about how bones protect your organs and how the reason you actually physically move is because you have skeletal muscles which attach to your skeletal bones. And that's most of the time when people think of muscles, these are the muscles that they're talking about. But what a lot of people don't realize is that your bones also store minerals and fats. All of your life you've heard how you need calcium for strong bones. And that's true because you're going to see that your bones have what's called spongy bone in them. Spongy bone is bone that has a lot of holes in it. Well, we don't want our bone to be carnivorous or, excuse me, you know, have lots of caverns in them because that makes our bones weak. And so we take the spongy bone and we fill it. And one of the things we fill it with is calcium, and that helps our bones stay strong. However, your bones don't actually use that calcium. One of the jobs of your bones is to feed your muscles calcium. When we talk about muscles later on, you'll see how calcium is needed in order to trigger muscle contraction. So we put calcium into our bones, and that does make our bones thicker, but our bones then turn around and secrete that calcium into our bloodstream so that our muscles can use it. This way we're constantly having to replace the calcium. Also, we have what's called yellow bone marrow, and yellow bone marrow gets its name because it does store fat. And so this is why, like, if you have a dog, when the dog is, eats the bone, it's trying to get to the bone marrow. Because remember, fat has taste. And this is why a lot of people, when they cook certain things, they throw bones into the to, to make broth. And so, like, if you're making, I know, we a lot of times take ham bones and throw them into the, the soup pot because there's fat in bones. And the whole heating process helps break down that fat, helps melt that fat, and fat is what gives the broth its taste. Also, in adults, our bones are responsible for blood cell formation. We also have what's called red bone marrow, and red bone marrow gets its name because it's red. It's go, you know, it makes blood. And the process of making blood is called hematopoiesis. Anytime you see the root word hema, hema always means blood, like hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a blood protein. 
And whenever you see poesis, think of a poet. Poesis means to create. Just like poets create these lovely poems, these lovely stories, these visions in our head, hematopoiesis means to create blood. And that's one of the jobs of our bone marrow, which we're going to look at here in just a second. Now, so what I was talking about, if you have your coloring book, this goes back to about page 10, and you can also look at page 17. On page 17 in your coloring book, you'll see what's called a long bone. This is actually a picture of the femur, if you have the anatomy coloring book. And with the picture of the femur, you'll notice that on that page, it talks about compact bone, it talks about cancellus, which is also called spongy bone, and you'll also see red bone marrow and yellow bone marrow. So if you have page 17 of the anatomy coloring book by Caput, my anatomy coloring book has two skulls on it, you can kind of follow along with what we're talking about. But in the case of compact bone, this is what people think of when they think of bone. It's that thick, hard bone. So when you touch bone, you're touching compact bone. That's what gives the bone its strength. And you can see that that makes up most of the outside of the bone. So these are tightly packed cells, because remember, the more packed you are, the more dense you are, the stronger you're going to be. Well, on the inside, we also have what's called spongy bone. And spongy bone gets its name because it has lots of holes in it. And as you can see on page 17 in the coloring book, it's also called cancellus bone. Well, if you're gonna have a lot of holes in you, that can actually make something very weak. Okay. And so therefore, our body takes that spongy bone and fills it up. Okay. So it's gonna fill up that empty space and it's gonna fill it up with what we've always called bone marrow. And like I mentioned, you can also see this on page 17. Bone marrow, we have red bone marrow and we have yellow bone marrow. Now, page 17 talks about how compact bone forms the stout walls of the diaphysis and the thinner outer surface of other bones, which we're going to talk about later, what diaphysis and all that stuff means. But compact bone, when you touch a bone, that's what you're touching. What dogs and other animals are trying to get to is the spongy bone on the inside. So if you were to crack a bone open, you would see that it's very porous. It has all these openings inside of it. And so if you have the anatomy coloring book and you're looking at page 17, you'll see that there's lots of stippled things there. Well, those stipples represent spongy bone. They represent the openings inside the bone in this picture. And so nature has filled this spongy bone with two types of bone marrow. Okay. The first type is red bone marrow. And it talks about how this is a gelatinous substance composed of red and white blood cells in a variety of developmental forms. And you'll see the term hematopoietic tissue. Your red bone marrow is red because this is where blood gets made. It is responsible for what we call hematopoiesis. And like we mentioned, hematopoiesis is how we make blood cells. Now, this is all going to be controlled by hormones, which we'll talk about later on when we actually talk about blood. But when you need to make red blood cells, a hormone says, hey, red bone marrow, I need some red blood cells. When you need certain types of white blood cells, your red bone marrow is going to make all this for you. But our red bone marrow is hematopoietic tissue. It's responsible for hematopoiesis, which is the making of blood. Well, your red bone marrow is alive. These are cells that have to create something. And so therefore they need nutrients. And so that's the job of the yellow bone marrow. Okay. Your yellow bone marrow is a fatty connective tissue. It is full of fat. That's why it is yellow. And remember, fat is a fuel that we use. So our fatty, our, our yellow bone marrow provides fat, provides nutrients to the cells of the red bone marrow. This is how the cells of the red bone marrow get some of their nutrients in order to continue their job. So you can see in this picture, we have the compact bone and we have the spongy bone. Well, bone is alive. Remember, bone is a tissue. So when we talk about the 206 bones of your body, that's 206 different organs. Because remember, organs are groups of tissues that work together. And in a bone such as the femur, we will have osseous tissue, which is the actual bone itself. We will have connective tissue, which is fat. We have membranes around it, and we have membranes inside of it. That's epithelial tissue. And we have blood vessels. We have blood, which is another type of connective tissue. So we're going to be looking at all this as we go through this. Now, this is going to go along with what we call ossification. And ossification is talked about on page 18 in your coloring book. And when we talk about ossification, ossification, ossi, remember meaning bone, ossification is a bone replacement. When we're first born, our skeleton is almost entirely hyaline cartilage. And we talked about hyaline cartilage in our tissue unit and how hyaline cartilage is very strong but flexible cartilage. And we need 
to be made from cartilage because we're all twisted up inside of our mother's uterus and then we have to be born. So we don't really, bone isn't flexible enough for that process. Now we do have bone in our face and in our skull and that's in order to protect the brain during the birthing process. But most of our skeleton is made from hyaline cartilage. And if you remember, hyaline cartilage is avascular, which means it doesn't have a lot of blood vessels going to it. So hyaline, this is one of the reasons why cartilage is so hard to repair. So a lot of people have, you know, cart has surgery on the cartilage in their joints because once it's damaged, it takes a long time to repair because it doesn't have this constant supply of nutrients coming to it through the bloodstream. Well, over time, cells do die. And our cartilage doesn't turn into bone in the process we call ossification. Our cartilage gets replaced by bone cells in order to make the hard skeleton that we have. And you're gonna see we have two types of ossification in our bodies. One is called endochondral ossification and one is called intramembranous ossification. And we're gonna talk about both of these here. However, after ossification occurs, we still keep cartilage in certain parts of our body. So like we said, we still have cartilage on the bridge of our nose. Our nose does stick off of our face, so it is gonna get hit. So therefore nature has put cartilage there to make it a little bit more flexible. We also have cartilage in our rib cage. This enables our rib cage to change shape so that we can breathe. And in both of these places, we have hyaline cartilage. We also have hyaline cartilage in our joints. It's given a special name, it's called articular cartilage. Anytime you see arthro or art, you guys know that that means joints like arthritis. And so articular cartilage is hyaline cartilage and it's there wherever we have movable joints in order to keep the bones from scraping up against each other. Now in our ears, we talked about how ears of our furry friends are very flexible in order to, ampl in order to amplify sound. And so it has to be more flexible than hyaline cartilage. And so our ears are actually made from elastic cartilage. But in the case of endochondral ossification, which is what page 18 in your book talks about, endo meaning inside, chondro is the root word for cartilage. So endochondral ossification means this is going to take place inside of cartilage. You have to have cartilage in order for this to take place. This only occurs twice in your life. It occurs when you are a newborn slash toddler, when your body is actually turning into bone. Because remember, when you're first born, you're skeleton is almost entirely hyaline cartilage. And then it occurs in your growth plates in order to make your bones grow longer. This is how you got bigger. But over time, we run out of cartilage. And so when we run out of cartilage, this type of ossification stops. So for most people watching this video, if you're a high school anatomy student, then you're done with this. You probably will never do endochondral ossification again. But like I said, if you have the coloring book, this goes along with page 18 in our coloring book. But cartilage, if you remember, is connective tissue, and so it has a lot of air space in it. It's what we call loose connective tissue. So its ground substance, if you remember, is like a gel. Well, bone is hard. So when ossification begins, salts such as calcium, potassium, will form a substance that's called hydrozapatate. And remember, this is the ground substance. Remember, that when we talk about a matrix, matrix is either a solid, a liquid, or a gel. And in cartilage, the matrix is a gel. And remember, ground substances are what make up the matrix. So hydrozapatite would be an example of a ground substance. It's made from lots of different types of minerals. And I kind of think of it as oatmeal. It's like wet cement. And so when ossification begins, remember this is all controlled by hormones. The hydrozapatite, this wet cement, kind of goes in and begins to fill in the empty spaces around the cartilage. At the same time, blood vessels will begin to grow. And so blood vessels will run through bone tissues in tunnels called herversion canals and canaliculi. Now on page 18, you can see all these different blood vessels that are running up and down. You can also flip back to page 10 in your coloring book. Page 10 in your coloring book down at the very bottom shows you osseous tissue again. You can see the bullseye. We talked about this. You can see the herversion canal, which is the bullseye of the bullseye pattern. And that's a tunnel that our blood vessels went through. And we talked about how you can see it mentions her version canals. It mentions canal aculi on page 10 of your coloring book. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so blood is alive. Blood needs nutrients. And so blood vessels will begin to grow throughout this area. And if they run up and down, they form the bullseye of that pattern, that osseous tissue pattern. And those tubes are called her version canals. 
Well, then some blood vessels run across the bone. They basically connect one Haversian canal to the next, and these are called canaliculi. And you can see both of these on page 10 of your coloring book. Now, when you are first born, your body is mostly hyaline cartilage. However, remember it takes cells to make cells. Cartilage cells will not make bone cells. So inside of the cartilage, you kind of have like little islands floating. And these islands are like floating bone making cells. So if you were to take a picture of cartilage, I mean, if you take an x-ray of cartilage, cartilage doesn't really show up on an x-ray. So you have like this ghost outline, but then you would see like a bright white dot right in the middle of that infant's femur or radius, whatever it is that you're taking a picture of. Because to make bone, we have to have bone. You know, that's one of the law, that's one of our cell theory laws. And so when an infant is first born, remember its skeleton is almost entirely hyaline cartilage, but we do have like these floating islands of what are called osteoblasts. Remember the root word osteo means bone. Anytime you see blast, a blast is going to make something. Like later on, we'll talk about a blastula. A blastula is what's going to become, you know, the embryo. Or it is an embryo, so it be what forms the fetus and the child. But osteoblasts are what we call bone-forming cells. When the infant is first born, its body is almost entirely hyaline cartilage. And then this hyaline cartilage will have these like little scattered islands of osteoblasts kind of floating around. And remember, we talked about contact inhibition. These bone cells won't start to divide unless they realize there's an empty space next to them. So as the chondrocytes, which are the cartilage cells, begin to die, if they're next to an osteoblast, then the osteoblast realizes, oh, there's an empty space here. And remember, bone cells, you know, they, have, they are given nutrients through blood cells, and they reproduce a lot faster than cartilage cells. So the bone cells go through mitosis and fill in that space. So the cartilage doesn't turn into bone, but as the cartilage dies, the bone cells now have room to start mitosis, and the bone cells eventually fill in that empty space. So this is why it's called endochondral, because this is occurring inside the cartilage. But eventually, over time, the cartilage will get replaced by bone. And so you and I really don't have any osteoblasts left. We have mature bone cells, which are called osteocytes. I remember when all bone is formed, all bone is formed as compact bone. So osteoblasts are the bones that we had, are the little cells we, that infants had to actually form what we now know of as a bone, our skeleton. We have osteocytes. And so like I said, all bone cells are formed tightly packed together, and this is our compact bone. And this is what gives our bone our strength. Now, think of the hydrozapatate as wet cement. If I were to put you in a pool and pour a bunch of cement on you, you would do everything that you could to dig yourself a space. You need an air pocket. Well, osteocytes have to do the same thing. Because remember, we are slowly taking cartilage, which is flexible, and making it into a very hard solid. So that hydrozapatate, that cement, is going to dry. So the osteocytes will actually fill up with water. They'll almost double in size and swell. And they'll do that while the ground substance, this wet cement, is still soft. That would be like me pouring a bunch of cement on you in a pool and you dig yourself an air pocket so that you have a place to grow, you have a place to breathe. And then once the hydrozapatate dries, they'll go back down to normal. Now the hydrozapatate will begin to harden, and when it's hard, it's called the lamella. And page 10 of your coloring book talks about the lamella. So when you touch bone, what you call bone, that hard compact bone, you're touching a mixture of bone cells and this hard cement. And this hard cement's what we call lamella. Now once the lamella gets hard, the bone cells will shrink back down to normal. And they've left themselves this nice little airy chamber that they can live inside of. And so this chamber that they live in is now called the lacuna. And it also talks about the lacuna on page 10 in your coloring book. Now while the hydrozapatate was trying, it would just be like you, and again, I'm not trying to hurt anybody, but it's just a good example of, you know, you're in a pool and I dump a whole bunch of you in the pool and I dump a bunch of cement on top of you. You're going to dig this hole and they're going to reach your hands out and you're going to grab your friend's hands. 
Well, that in turn will leave a channel that will leave a channel from one lacuna to the next. And this is how bone cells can um, secrete hormones or share nutrients and basically talk back and forth to each other. And this is what forms the bullseye pattern. So if the bone will form around the Haversian canal, and so it's got this bullseye pattern showing where the lacuna are and where these channels are where these cells kind of hold hands. Well, we also have osteoclast. Don't get osteoblast, osteocytes, and osteoclast mixed up. Osteoblasts are the cells that go through mitosis in order to allow for endochondral ossification to take place. Osteocytes are what you and I now call bone cells. But remember, when bone gets made, all bone is made as compact bone. Well, we have to make spongy bone. So we have enzyme-containing cells called osteoclasts inside of us. And osteoclasts are bone-destroying cells. And osteoclast's job is to secrete digestive enzymes. And those digestive enzymes help basically erode. They eat these little chambers that form our spongy bone. And then our body turns around and fills it up in or with bone marrow. So if we go back to this picture, you can see what's called, they have it labeled Sharpie fibers and the periosteum. And then on the inside where the spongy bone is, you would have what's called the end osteum. End meaning inside. So periosteum would be the membrane on the outside of the bone, and the end osteum would be the membrane lining the spongy bone. So therefore, compact bone would be found between the periosteum and the end osteum. So, intramembranous means between the membranes. So, this is what we do hopefully for the rest of our lives. It helps us repair our bones. It helps us keep our bone cells alive. It helps us keep our bones as thick as they're supposed to be. And then last but not least, when we talk about hormones. Remember, hormones are how cells talk to each other. And our endocrine system is the hormone system. And pretty much almost every organ in your body makes a hormone. And so we've been talking about hormones as they relate to the system. Important hormones that go along with ossification, we have calcium controlling hormones. And this hormone is called calcitonin. So obviously it makes sense. It has something to do with calcium. And remember your bones store the calcium but your muscles actually use it. So calcitonin is actually the hormone that says, hey, bones, I need you to absorb calcium, I need you to take that calcium, and I need you to store that calcium. And calcitonin is made by your thyroid gland, which is a gland that is in your neck region. Well, remember, most things negative feedback. So one hormone kind of turns something on and one hormone turns something off. Well, calcitonin tells your bones, hey, store the calcium. So there has to be a hormone that says, hey, bones, Release the calcium, because remember, like, release the hounds, because your bones store the calcium that your muscles need to use. So the hormone that does that is called the parathyroid hormone. And your thyroid gland is kind of shaped like a butterfly. It sits in your neck. Well, if you were to cut into your thyroid gland at, like, each of the wings, you would see, like, a small, round gland. Your parathyroid glands, you actually have four of them. Your parathyroid glands are actually found inside of your thyroid gland. But the thyroid gland secretes calcitonin, which tells your bones to store calcium, and your parathyroid gland negative feedbacks that. Remember, negative feedback means they work opposite of each other, and this is the hormone that tells your bones to release calcium. 